Hi, it's Judy Long. I am coming to you on the 50th anniversary of Fielding Graduate University, and I'm supposed to talk to you today about my research and my scholarship and uh, Fielding from my point of view. I came to Fielding 40 years ago. I was 40 years old and now I'm 80. So I've been around a long time and know a lot about the history. One of my favorite memories is the first faculty meeting I went to, and you have to realize I was teaching at Cal State LA when I was invited to Fielding for the first time as a part-time faculty member, because at that point, we didn't have any full-time faculty members. Everybody was part-time. And uh, we were not fully credited yet, and so it was a wonderful time when we had so much fun. There was a lot of fun involved in Fielding at the, that stage. One of my favorite memories is dressing up in tights and uh, being a member of the spandex dancers, which we used to do at No Talent Night. And believe me, we had no talent. It was me and Rich Applebaum and Jeremy Shapiro dancing to whatever pop tune we could find. And one was uh, I'm Looking for a Hero. And uh, they, were way, <laughs> they were riding stick horses, you know, and I was dancing and they were sh fighting with each other over me. It was very funny and we had such a good time doing it. But I also wanted to talk to you about my recent research. I've been very involved in the study of wisdom and as the senior editor of a handbook by Oxford called the International Handbook of Adult Development and Wisdom. Quite a mouthful. <laughs> That's going to be about 600 pages long, so it is a tome and I have collected uh, people from all over the world to work on it. So there are people from China, people from India, people from Cyprus and Finland and Iran of all places. I was so surprised and happy to find somebody who wanted to write for this volume from Iran. Um, and it should be out by the end of the year. The last chapter, in the first chapter, I do a review of theory and adult development, um, as well as some work on uh, what stages in adult development are and how temperament and emotional development is related to adult development. That was quite a task, and <clears throat> I'm really happy that it's over. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun to go through all of that work when the chapters were turned in and do a kind of thematic analysis for those of you who are interested in research. Um, I went through and I tried to pick out all of the characteristics of uh, wise people that were included in each of these chapters and came to the conclusion that there are a lot of forces that are involved in becoming wise. Um, one basic one is just temperament. People who have easy temperaments, people who are naturally positive. <coughs> I'm having trouble today with my throat, so excuse me. People who have positive temperaments, who are more optimistic, um, and who are likely to attack a problem with persistence and uh, enthusiasm are more likely to become wise than those who are irritable or depressed or uh, pessimistic. And we don't know why that is exactly. Pessimistic people are supposed to be more realistic than optimistic people. So maybe it's good not to be realistic in this world at times. Um, what wise means is, in this sense, the ability to help people solve life problems regardless of what age they are, in a way that's effective and efficient and um, likely to create a positive outcome. So wisdom is really measured a lot by advice giving, and there's two kinds of wisdoms at, at least. The first kind is expert knowledge. And actually, if you're a psychologist and you have been studying human behavior your whole life, then you have a good chance of being wise. Actually, therapists are some of the people who are considered wise because you've been um, thinking about 
human development and why people behave the way they do and how to change that behavior for a very, very long time. Uh, it's also true that there is a kind of transcendent wisdom and that transcendent wisdom means to be connected to the universe or God or however you want to talk about that, to feel like you are one with, uh, you identify with, the whole cosmos, and particularly with the planet, with the animals, with the environment, with uh, ability to identify not only with other people, but with everything, and to feel like you are part of a whole that is um, harmonious and uh, makes you feel whole to be identified in that way. So the ability to identify with a big horizon of, um, of beings and, uh, and landscapes is very important in becoming wise, uh, to feel positive and enthusiastic about the choices that people have, to know how to frame them, to know how to help somebody reframe a situation as a challenge or a lesson rather than a tragedy. Those are all the kinds of things that are involved in every culture when we talk about people being wise. But transcendent wisdom goes beyond just being able to give good advice or just being able to point out because of your expert knowledge what's going on in a particular situation and help other people cope with that situation. Wisdom goes beyond that, transcendent wisdom goes beyond that in that people feel connected to that whole wide range of possibilities and feel whole and it is a spiritual kind of event that people feel wise in that way. And if you look at who is considered wise in history, you find a lot of the people who are wise were people who are interested in the improvement of human life in general. So we find, for example, Xerxes is an example from uh, the Middle East that I was somewhat acquainted with, but not very well known, I think, and Pre and created and handed down a lot of laws that help people get along in life better and treat each other better. Um, Gandhi, Lincoln, and on the distaff side, as we used to call it, or the female side, someone like Mother Teresa or Eleanor Roosevelt. There aren't very many women who end up on that list of highly wise and highly admired people in history. And I have been wondering about that and wondering if there's a certain kind of wisdom that women bring to the situation that's not typically considered wisdom in the big general sense of doing something like Gandhi, of being able to change a culture, or Lincoln running a war for a... Uh, <clears throat> for a moral reason, moral outrage, those kinds of things are apparently not as common in women. I think looking at the women who are considered wise in the culture uh, and looking at their actions and looking at their lives would be an important step in furthering our understanding of wisdom. Um, <clears throat> in everyday life uh, and transcendent wisdom as well. So I encourage you to take a look at some of that research to get a hold. I'm sure Fielding will have a copy of the book when it comes out this year and take a look at that summary chapter in particular if you're interested in wisdom. I began life actually as a behavior analyst. Uh, I was trained at UCLA in what was called experimental psychopathology, which means that I know how to make you crazy. <laughs> but we were studying the development of autistic children and we were using behavioral techniques to teach them to speak and respond to language. I worked for an entire year with a little boy whose name was Jose, <clears throat> who had been a victim of brain damage at an early age because of having seizures at high temps. 
It took me an entire year to teach him to raise his hand on command and say his own name. Um, you only have so much, <laughs> so much patience in life for that kind of work. And when I went to Cal State LA, my first publications were in behavior analysis. I wanted to get tenure. I was just grinding it out. And when I finally came to a point that I felt comfortable that I had done enough to earn tenure, I turned my attention really to starting over again, getting myself a PhD in human development, adult development, studying it myself as a young professor. And there wasn't much at the time. There was some work by sociologists on middle age, especially midlife crisis. Um, and there was, of course, work on gerontology, but nobody brought it together as adult development yet. I wrote the first textbook in adult development for psychology, um, and it was published in, I believe the publication date of the first one is 1979. It went through five iterations, so there was a fifth edition, 1993 was the last edition, but it is often cited as being one of the foundational reasons for uh, the study of adult development to become a more well-populated field, let's say. Um, and of course, I love it because the study of adult development is the study of everything. It's the study of how you got to be an adult, how adult you are, how grown up you are, what kind of a parent you are, what kind of a friend, what kind of a sibling. There's just endless amounts of things that you can study if you're studying adult development. And I think that's one of the things that appealed the most to me. So the first forays that I made into the study of adult development were around issues like marriage. Of course, I had been divorced twice. I'm in my third marriage now. It's lasted 35 years. I think it's a success. I don't think I'm going to be leaving it now. <laughs> but I was really interested in why people go through a second divorce and a third marriage. So I did a lot of research. I did a lot of interviews. And I decided that one of the things that women are doing when they divorce and remarry is that they're marrying up a lot of times to a more educated or successful person than they were married to before. I don't know how general that is, but among the people that I interviewed were mostly upper middle class people, middle class people who were in the situation of getting divorced twice. Um, I found that that was pretty much the case. So. Um, after that, I started really being the person who did a lot of work on theory in adult development, constantly reporting and trying to integrate the study of development. And that's also what I spent a lot of time on doing in the chapter that I wrote for the handbook, trying to show how you could integrate the study of adult development <clears throat> in the last 50 years which really has focused on cognitive development. Not much work has been done on emotional development or temperament. So what I tried to do in that chapter was to bring together cognitive development, emotional development, and temperament to show how they relate to adult development because the wisest people among us are the people who are able to think systemically. That is to take into consideration greater and greater context. And as I told you before, wise people tend to identify with more contexts, more beings, more humans, more animals, more spaces and environments than other people do, which of course then would make it easier for them to make statements that might transcend a particular person's situation and talk more about, in general, how to handle difficulties and problems in life. So that's kind of the research that I've been doing, where I come from about fielding. I've been offered so many opportunities at fielding that I had, were not able to access other places I worked as a full professor at Cal State LA and also at the University of Washington. And in neither place did I find that there was much room for creativity in 
curriculum development and delivery, and that's been another big area of mine for research. I've been very interested in what makes a good online program and what doesn't. So you'll find some of my work in that area. I also got really interested in the long-term outcome of a PhD study in particular, and in particular amongst middle-aged people. So I did a big interview study of alums from Fielding and was able to point out that they showed uh, that they had changed, they felt that they had changed in how they thought, so that they thought more systemically and more broadly than they did before and more critically than they did before. They felt that emotionally they were less defensive, more able to understand what they and what they knew and what they didn't know, um, and more able to understand the limits of human knowledge in a lot of ways, since so much of what we're interested in is how we feel and think, and that's all internal, then it's very important to try to find measures and ways to externalize um, the development of people. And so there's been a lot of work on that that I've reviewed over and over again. I feel like all of the theories that we have now, behavioral theories, psychodynamic theories, sociological theories, can be fitted together, can be brought together as aspects of human development, and different theories apply to different areas of human development. So for example, when I'm thinking about cognition, I turn to stage there in Piaget and his followers in adult development. When I'm thinking about emotional development, I think more about psychoanalytic theory. I mean, how can we think about other human beings anymore without thinking about the unconscious, which is a psychodynamic construct, or defensiveness, which I was just talking about, and that is a psychoanalytic construct. We use psychoanalytic constructs a lot to think about other people's emotional reactions. And then the sociology of it as well. That is, what makes a good family? What makes a good marriage in the United States today? Um, what's good parenting? How do we grow old gracefully? Those kinds of questions are also included. <laughs> they wanted me to talk a little bit about my scholarship, <clears throat> the scholarship that I founded. I wanna tell you that there aren't a lot of human development people around. Um, in the program, there are many more organizational development people. So for those of you who are interested in human development, I want you to know that the scholarship is often underapplied and that it can be connected to Charlie Seashore's scholarship about organizations. So if you're studying human development, adult development in the context of organizations, you could definitely apply for both scholarships. Well, I hope that um, 40 years from now, when I am long gone, Fielding is still <clears throat> finding ways to make education for adults exciting, interesting, um, and suitable to allowing people to function more effectively in a very, very complex society. Um, it's good that uh, we're doing these things. I'm excited to have this posted and see what kind of reactions I get to it. Um, please let me know if you saw it and what you thought. Uh, and I hope that I get a chance to talk to you all again soon. Bye.